Today we're going to be talking about anxiety. <laughs> Woohoo! Toria said, you know, even just mentioning that, some people will be triggered. You know, if you're struggling with anxiety, you might already just feel like, oh my gosh. But it is such a real emotion, isn't it? It's a human emotion that every single one of us wrestles with. And I think my experience is the older you get, the more things there are to worry about. Um, and it's that, it, we know it, it's that kind of gnawing, horrible, unsettled, yucky thing in your stomach that just won't go away. You wake with it and you go to bed with it and you, sometimes you know what it is and sometimes you, you don't. It's, it's that, that feeling of a, of something that is coming that is a threat there is something that is foreboding and it's a worry is everything going to be okay am I going to be okay things at work is my job going to be okay am I going to keep my job am I going to be good enough am I going to be approved is my future going to be okay will I meet anyone will I have kids when you have kids you worry about your kids and then for some of you your grandkids and they're, they're, the worries can can multiply and now obviously we know like the wars that are happening and even the threats of wars and the political landscape feels like the ice is getting thinner and thinner and a hair's breadth this way or that way and you feel like the geopolitical situation and it feels like wow within a couple of decisions war could be on our doorstep you think so you have these waves of anxiety that i don't need to rehearse but they're there right they're real we all go through this and david himself was a man who wrestled with anxiety he wrestled with fear the psalms are filled with essentially king david wrestling with the temptation to give in to fear and anxiety he he knew and he wasn't just like a poet who lolled around on grassy pastures looking at butterflies thinking of new things to write about god he was a man who from a very young age as a young boy knew what it was to live with threat in his life as a shepherd he lived with a daily constant threat of bears or lions or bandits who he would have to personally fight he had his own the father figure in his life Saul turn on him and try and seek him out and and kill him he had his own son plot against him politically to overthrow him his own son so he would go to sleep within the the city walls and absalom would be outside the city walls within eyesight plotting talking to people campaigning against him he knew what it was to try and sleep within a tent and have armies a couple of miles across valleys planning to to kill him he knew what it was to try and eat dinner and wrestle with that anxious feeling and wondering is everything going to be okay tomorrow am i going to be okay is my livelihood going to be okay what about my future this is this is this is real and I, the, the most common command in the scripture as many of you will know is not be holy be a good person it's don't fear and I, I love that because God knows what it is for us to be human that what life is wildly unpredictable you think sometimes you like you just contemplate the expanse of life and the unpredictability of life and you think anything could happen and that is a frightening thought and God knows and he speaks to us continually says don't fear and there's reason why you shouldn't fear it's funny because Tori um, we we're just chatting whenever our the secretary of the school where our two kids go to whenever they call us the first thing they do is say everything's all right with your child <laughs> you know and then etc cetera, etc cetera, because they know if school's calling you're like what's gone wrong that's how God addresses us it's like first of all you need to know everything's going to be okay and here's some things i need to tell you and david reflects on this and, and as a as a man who was a shepherd and he knew this he reflects on seasons of fear and anxiety and threat as like walking through valleys 
And when we think valleys, if you know England, you think kind of the Yorkshire Dales. It's lush, it's glorious, you go on holiday there. That's where you go to rest and there's a nice stream that runs through it. But valleys in Palestine were, were nothing like this. One shepherd who had experienced one of these types of valleys that David would have had to have gone through expresses it like this, describes it like this. The path plunges downward into a deep and narrow gorge of sheer precipices overhung by following sphinx-like battlements of rocks which almost touch overhead. Its, size, its side walls rise like the stone walls of a great cathedral. The valley is about five miles long. Yet it is not more than 12 feet at the widest section of the base. The actual path on solid rock is so narrow that in places the sheep can hardly turn around in case of danger. I read that, I thought, wow, my mind, what I understood of the valley is a long way off reality. I thought, valley, ooh, valleys in England. like No, no, th these are places of danger. And isn't this life? And she, you get to this place where it's dangerous, there is threat, you're anxious, you're struggling to keep walking, and there's no way out. It's not like you've ever been in that situation like, I, I'm anxious, I am worried about the future, and you're trying to find, like, where, where do I go? Where, where, where's the way out of this situation? And there doesn't seem to be any way out. You literally have to keep walking. This is life. And, and David here is reflecting on this thing. It's like walking through a dark valley, the shadow of death, which is really just death is the mother of all fears. Death is the ultimate enemy that will render life and all your plans and all your hard work and all your accomplishments and all that you've achieved and all that you've gained and all that you've just render it meaningless. And so all other fears just sit under this fear of death and we walk through this, all this anxiety and, and fear. And in this place, I want to suggest, in, in the middle of these valleys which we, we, we live within, the world approaches this moment very differently to David. The world, I want to suggest, makes at least two mistakes. The first is this, that the, the world tries to treat anxiety and fear through purely a therapeutic frame. The, the West is so individualistic and so feelings led that basically dealing with anxiety is just dealing with the symptoms of anxiety and your feelings and it's miserable but it just tries to deal therapeutically with how do we get rid of these anxious feelings without any reason or grounding as to why you should get rid of those anxious feelings because our, the basic philosophy is that in the West anyway is that life's going to be fine it's like the Lion King Akuna Matata, right? It's like, it's a problem-free philosophy. That's what we've got to live with, you know? Tomorrow, pff, whatever. And so if, if you're feeling anxious, the problem must be something within you. There's something in your emotional life, your past, your parents, whatever it is. It's always your parents' fault, isn't it, these days? And they're digging around and there, and the, so we deal with that. And, and no real sense that there is actually danger. No, 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 life's fine. We've got to deal with your emotions. But, but what if there is actually good reason to be anxious? What if there is actually an enemy out there? What if the Bible is true and that Satan is prowling around us like a roaring lion seeking to devour us? What if there are armies of demons strategizing your downfall at the moment? What if hell is real? What if sin is an infection in your life that is destroying you from the inside? What if death is your ultimate enemy that will render your life meaningless at the drop of a hat? What if all that's real? The world doesn't have an answer for that. The world says, no, 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 it's fine. It's like us being in a lion's cage. And there is a lion like five meters away and the world's saying, no, let's not talk about the lion today. Let's talk about your feelings about the lion. That's what's really the problem. How are you feeling about being in this lion's cage? No, death's not a worry. Don't worry about that. Like, you need to focus on your feelings today. We have an enemy. There is reason to be afraid. It's not just a kuna matata. There is heaven and there is hell. There's light and there's darkness. 
God and there's Satan. We, we need more than just stroking our feelings and more therapy. That's the first problem. The second problem is we, we kind of tell ourselves that we can face life. I mean, I was, I was scrolling through some guy and he was looking ridiculously buff for a 60 year old. Don't know why it popped up on my YouTube thing, but <laughs> my hope for the future. Uh, anyway, and this guy was giving it all this. He was like, yeah, age is just a number to me. I don't care that I'm 60. I don't, I'm basically said, I'm not like everyone else who gives in to age. I don't care how old do I get. I'm just gonna carry on. Basically like, it doesn't matter. I was like, it's the, the, with all like, respect, it's just silly. <laughs> I was gonna say ruder language, but. Because one day we will all be at death's door and for all this macho bravado, oh, I'm gonna work out, I don't care, age is just a number to me. Like, no, death has a 100% record and will destroy us. So for as strong as you feel, there are still enemies out there. And yet, yet we say, no, no, I got this. If, if the world were gonna write verse four of this, they say, you know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because I'm an alpha in this life. <laughs> I don't cower to, to death, to life. I don't cower to anyone. I got this. That's how, that's how we would kind of counsel ourselves. And yet David, who in all honesty is someone, you know, I would like to model my life. He was a man's man. He was a leader of men. He was a leader of armies. Saul killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. He was a man who knew how to handle himself in battle. He was confident. And yet he identifies himself before God, not as a lion, but as a sheep. For all of his prowess, for all of his strength, for all of his fighting skills, he says, no, I identify as a, a sheep. What is a sheep? A sheep can't fight. A sheep has, has nothing to, to commend itself in a fight. Has no claws, has no teeth or fangs, has nothing to like, has no speed, no strength. Like, like it's got nothing going for it in a fight. And David says, there are some enemies and I'm, I'm like a sheep. That's how I walk through life. I need a shepherd. And for many of us, in our fight against fear and temptation, we need to dismantle the illusion that we are alpha, that we are a lion, that we have got this. And we need to accept our sheep-like nature because it's only then that we can actually turn to help because there are some, and David was wise enough to know there were some enemies he couldn't face on his own. Toria, um, gave me permission to share this, but some of you, many of you will know, Tori has struggled with anxiety for most of her life, is that fair? And, um, uh, and panic attacks, and through COVID it, it got worse. And one of the things that she shared was that one of the things that she realized in her fear and anxiety was the, the fear of public shame. You can talk to her later. I'm just giving you her words that she gave to me. Um, her, her feeling that if she did have a panic attack on the tube or in public, the fear of actually looking silly and looking vulnerable and looking weak in front of others was actually the thing that was causing the panic attack. And when she became to accept that she could look silly and vulnerable in front of people and that it would, it would be okay, the panic and the anxiety and the fear began to to dissipate. It was the acceptance of sheep-like nature. Because if you're trying to be alpha in control and I've got this, then you are actually in the end fighting against things that you can't fight against. So for many of us, especially the accomplished ones amongst us, we need to accept. David was accomplished. We're not saying walk around, you know, looking at your toes and poor me. No, David was an accomplished, confident leader and he identified as a sheep. We need that. It's, it's taken me years. I mean, I, I don't think I ever actually said the word I feel anxious until I was like into my mid thirties. I was, I just didn't, I, I couldn't even get to the place of admitting it. I remember the first few times I told Tori, she was like, what's going on, uh, everything's changing. But uh, I was like, I, I gotta realize, no, I, it's, it's okay. It's like, I, I have to accept my, my vulnerability in this. 
So what I want us to do is, is learn with David how he walked through this valley. Verse four, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He walks, doesn't skit, doesn't run. I'd be tempted to hot foot it through it. You know, I'm getting out of here ASAP. I mean, I'm such a chicken. Some of you know St. Luke's, where uh, Hope Church St. Luke's, a big old Anglican building. And uh, I used to be one of the team there. And I used to be one of the last people to turn off the lights. And, and so the, the lights were at one end of this big Anglican building. And uh, then if you were the last one there, you'd have to turn off all the lights and suddenly this like, it looked like Gotham City with inside. It was just dark and foreboding. You know, I was, I'm a Christian. I'm like an adult. I was the pastor. <laughs> like, like everything in me, I'd been there all day. I knew who was in the room, like no one was there. And yet every time I turned off the lights and I had about 80 meters to walk across the church, I was like, <laughs> footing you worried and I would literally say Jesus you are the light of the world like I was anxious that either there was a church member who didn't like me who was going to attack me or someone who had like homeless guy who was going to like or a demon who was going to going to come out I don't I was genuinely like it was so dark and large and foreboding but David he walks through the valley of the shadow of death he, uh, I'm walking and he has he has reasons to and, and, and for all of us, we, we need to have a vision for valleys in our life. We have to have a framework in our life for valleys because valleys are going to come. Deep darkness is going to come. Threat is going to come. Anxiety and fear, it's going to come. Some of you, it has already come. Some of you, you're in it right now. And we need to know with David how to walk through the valley. David doesn't look to himself, he looks to God. So what I'm praying is for revelation of the nature of God today. That, that the Holy Spirit would reveal the nature of, of God. And what we're going to do at the end, we're going to pray for people because this is a real thing. It's not just, here's some thoughts for you to take away. We're going to pray that, that we would know the shepherding of God. Amen. So if, if the, well, I, I want you even to be prepared now just to come and be ready to be, to be prayed for. We prayed earlier in the prayer meeting at 10.15 that strongholds would be broken today. That people who have lived in fear and anxiety and have felt captive to it, that they would know that they can turn and walk away. You can walk away. You can walk with Jesus. So three things that David knew that we need to know in the valley, amen? Three things. The first is this, the Lord, is with us he says this even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil why for you are with me it's it, it it's a double pain isn't it not just one to go through the valley but then the feeling that you are in the valley alone loneliness is the double pain isn't it that no one is with you, that no friends know what it's like to walk with you, and that for some of us, even the fear that God has rejected us and God has abandoned us. And some of us know those moments of our darkest moments where the feelings, we look to the heavens and it feels like God has turned his back on us. That's the ultimate fear. It's like when you watch, or some of you have got like a core memory of being left or lost by a parent. Anyone? Anyone have those memories of being like a three-year-old? Or you see now in a supermarket, you know, in Tesco's, you know, what, what can happen to a three-year-old? They're walking with their mum or dad, and then a split second later, they think they're walking and mum has gone the other way and they can't see. And within, what, two or three seconds, it's complete panic stations, right? <laughs> Nothing's changed. Like they're still on the dairy aisle. There's still, everything's fine. There's people everywhere. Everything's okay, but mum's not there. Like 
We, we need someone to walk with us. I look back on my life as a child and, you know, on the Saturday, my dad would take me places or, you know, I'd just be his companion for the day. We're doing jobs and I have all these memories. I don't know why about going to car garages. And even as an adult, I find garages, mechanics, very intimidating places because they just, I don't know, they just know stuff and they act, I don't know, I kind of give the car and they say, oh, it's this, that, that. And, I'm like, oh. and then, but as a kid, you know, I would walk into this big garage where we used to go to and I was like calm, not because I knew how like cars and MOTs and garages and mechanics like talked, but I was with dad, right? I think I, I went all sorts of places and went in all, all sorts of places with dad because I, I, I don't know how this works, but I'm with him. He knows how to do life around here, so I just hang around with him. And that's, that's what we need. And what we find out with God is that he doesn't get to the entrance of our valleys and say, right, uh, at this point, it's about five miles north. If you just keep going, I've got a Land Rover here. I'm just going to jump in the car and have a cup of coffee and I'll, I'll meet you at the other side. No, what do we find? God walks into the darkness with us. The Son of God leaves the green pastures of heaven and he comes down into the valley of life and he walks into life with us and experiences all of life with us. Charles Spurgeon, who was a Baptist minister, he wrote a commentary uh, about the Psalms, but he wrote this about Psalm 23. He said, you can't read Psalm 23 without, it, without reading Psalm 22. And that the God of Psalm 23 is a God of Psalm 22. Two, he says this, it follows the 22nd Psalm, which is good maths, which is pe peculiarly the Psalm of the cross in Psalm 22. He says in this Psalm, there are no green pastures and no still waters on the other side of the 22nd Psalm. It is only after we have read, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we can come to the Lord is my shepherd. We must by experience know the value of the blood shedding and see that the sword was awakened against the shepherd before we shall be able to truly know the sweetness of the good shepherd's care. That Jesus, these words in Psalm 22 are placed into the mouth and the experience of Jesus. My God, my God on the cross, why have you forsaken me? Listen to his experience, but I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by people. He lived these moments with us. I am poured out, he says, like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. You remember Jesus Christ facing the threat of death in Gethsemane and he experiences a sinless full-blown panic attack the son of god walks with us into places of threat and darkness he is in the midst of the valley with us which is why david could say later about the lord where shall i go from your spirit or where shall I free, flee from your presence? It says there's nowhere. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. It says on my best days, I'm with God. And he says, if I make my bed in shoal, that is, if I make my bed in a place of death and darkness and anxiety, what does he say? You're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uppermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So know this, church, that you are not alone. God is with you. Amen. Amen. The second thing is this. What does the shepherd hold in his hand? He actually holds two things. But the first is this. He holds a rod. And, and this is where for us, sometimes the Sunday school sheets that we coloured in as a kid don't serve us well. Because if you imagine shepherds normally, you imagine maybe if you've coloured in those sheets, in you know uh, Sunday school like they're nice kind of calm gentle looking guys wouldn't say boo to a goose which is as far from a shepherd in David's days as could be possible a shepherd in David's day wouldn't feel out of place in an octagon ring doing MMA these guys knew hand-to-hand -hand combat they fought bears they fought lions I was gonna say hand to pork combat but it's just too much of a dad joke so anyway 
But David himself would find bears who had taken his sheep. So not only would he be like, okay, that's one sheep done. Like, I guess we're all safe. Everyone else safe. We're fine. We'll let them. No, David would say, I would hunt the bear down and kill him. Shepherds were tough. And we're told that he holds a rod in his hands. This rod was maybe normally about a, a, foot, a foot long. And it was cut and carved particularly as a weapon. And at one end, they would place shards of metal into it as a weapon to use. Who remembers uh, PC Micah, who was part of the church for a while? Anyone? Yeah, so uh, PC Micah lodged with us. He's called PC Micah because he was a PC. And we have our son Micah. And every time we shouted at Micah to come downstairs, it scared older Micah and thought he was getting told off. Or we told Micah, brush your teeth. And he'd be like, ah, his landlord's horrible. Um, so he became PC and we had our son Micah. Anyway, it was really fun. And I liked having a policeman with us, mainly because, you know, he could deal with the dangerous people who would come to our door sometimes and like <laughs> delegate my manliness to PC Micah. And, uh, but he had all these amazing stories. And one of the things I've often wondered about, I don't know whether you have, but I have wondered about is like, how much force, uh, this is insight into my brain, how much force are you allowed to use against someone if they were to like enter your home or attack you? I don't know if that's a particularly male thing or like, I've often wondered like, what could I actually do legitimately? Because you don't want to get in trouble, but you also want to defend yourself and feel like you can be a man and defend the house. So I was like, what, what are you actually allowed to do? And he, he said this, and I'm not giving like law advice or anything like this, but this is what he said. He said, you're allowed to use stuff in the home, right? So if someone breaks into your house, if you happen to have a kitchen knife that was there or a golf club or you play baseball, you, they just happen to be there. You're allowed to pick them up and use them in self-defense. But you're not allowed to buy a baseball bat and leave it there deliberately with the intent that that is your weapon if somewhere were to come. Does that make sense? It feels like a fine line to me. I'm like, but uh, <laughs> there, there is intent to use. So if it's a kitchen knife that you were cutting carrots with, that's okay. If you have a kitchen knife in a box that says use to attack the invader, that's not okay. <laughs> and what we find with God is that he has a rod in his hand with shards of metal at one hand with legitimate intent to use it lawfully to smash the teeth of our enemies to fight on our behalf he is no weak god don't think that oh well, things are happening what about the christians and the persecution don't think because there's persecution that he's weak he holds a rod in his hand and we're told in Psalm 2 that he smashes his enemies like, pot, like pottery. He fights on our behalf. We are sheep and so he wields a weapon. Smashes our idea sometimes of God. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, like won't say boo to a goose, he'll stroke your hair to sleep. He might do that but he'll also fight and defeat the enemies. We're told in 1 John 3, 8 that Jesus, you know why the Son of God came? To destroy the works of the enemy. I prayed that prayer a lot over the last six months. Destroy the works of the enemy, Jesus. Smash the enemy's teeth. So that when you do get attacked, it's not fatal. You may get spiritually bruised in life, but Jesus fights. He fights against sin. He destroys sin so that we can walk free from sin. He does a judo move on death. He walks towards death. Death comes to him and he turns everything on its head and he receives the punishment of death in his own body. And in so doing, he defeats death for us. Why? Because he wields a rod in his hand. So even to this day, he fights on your behalf. He prays for you that your faith will not fail. The days when you feel like, I don't know whether I can make it, Jesus is praying. And you've got better believe that his prayers are listened to. 
When Jesus says, Lord, uphold this person today. They don't know whether they can face it through the day and even make it to work or make it at home. Lord, would you sustain them? Every word of Jesus is heard by the Father and answered. He fights for you. He is no weak God. Some of us, we need to let Jesus fight for us. Stop trying to be a lion in your own life. Stop trying to do it. I've got to do it by myself. Some of you got to say, I'm a sheep, Lord. I need you to fight today for me because I can't. Hey, Karumba. And the third thing is this, that Jesus, our shepherd, he holds a staff in his hand. The staff was for leading the sheep, as you know, had a crook on the end. So sometimes sheep would walk up crevices that were dangerous and pull them down, sometimes pull them out, sometimes a gentle nudge to make sure the sheep made it home safely, made it through the valley. Because here's the good news. We don't end up in the valley. We walk through the valley. Amen. There is a table waiting for us. If only we could see. There's wine being poured for us. There is cutlery being laid. Jesus is preparing a table for us where we will dine in the presence of our enemies. There is hope beyond the valley. We have to walk through it. And this is the comforting thing. Jesus is with us, leading us, which means two things for our comfort. The first is this. You are in the valley, not by accident or by your own fault. Don't think that that redundancy or that hardship or this difficulty or this ill health is your fault or that Jesus had his, his head turned or like God was taking breakfast for a couple of months and he turned back around to try and look for you and he couldn't find you and you're lost in the valley and you're like, no, 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 no. Jesus walks with a staff in his hand leading you every step of the way. And if he's taken you into a valley, he has taken you there for good purpose. All things, we're told, Romans 8, work together for the good of those who love him, even the valleys of life. And the main thing that Jesus is concerned with, and hear me, hear me, the main thing that Jesus is concerned with in your life is, is the main thing is not your physical health. The main thing he's concerned with is that you would know him. Because Jesus said in John 17, 3, that in the knowledge of him, in that knowledge, there is eternal life. You, you could have good health all your life, have money and ease and die and go to hell. Jesus cares for you too much to let you have that. Sometimes he takes us through valleys so that we can recognize our vulnerability and actually turn and know Jesus. This is what he says in Psalm 23, because in, when, it's, when it's nice, in the beginning of the psalm, in the green pastures, the psalmist, he talks about God, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me, he restores me, he, and, and look how the relationship turns when he's in the valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the thoughtful, why? For it's you now. There is this closeness and this intimacy that he has in the valley because, yeah, he, he'd heard of God like over there, but now he's walked through this valley. He knows God like a shepherd and he's, he's not just over there. He's my shepherd and I'm going to talk to you intimately. Some of you know the moments in life where you've had them when you've gone through hardship and you know the sweetness of the relationship with God in those moments. Anyone? Sometimes you can walk out of the valleys and you think life, you think, phew, everything's okay now. But there is also this weird feeling of, but I also felt like I knew God better back then in the valley. Anyone? You go through these moments and you think, I, I don't want to go back there, but I, st I want the closeness of, with Jesus because of that. Jesus wants that and he will fight for you to come to him. So sometimes he will lead you through it, but this is the second thing. He will lead you th through it. <laughs> this is what he, he will take you through. You're too precious to Jesus to let you die in the valley. You are too precious to Jesus for him to let you die there and not make it home. He, he died for you. Your good shepherd suffered and died infinitely on the cross do not think that he will now abandon you he has bound himself body and soul to you eternally so that you and him are now one in his death and in his res resurrection 
and he will lead you home. What is our comfort in life and death? This, that we don't belong to ourselves, but we belong to Jesus, body and soul, in life and in death, and his eyes are on us, and they will forever be upon us, amen? I've, I have felt a particular anxiety this week, and we were just chatting to her and I went for a walk before and she was just sharing how it feels like anxiety is something where the enemy has, has got a grip in our generation. Like it feels like, there's, it feels like there, is a, there is a spiritual stronghold of anxiety. And she just reflects, I wonder whether you are feeling anxiety because we're, in a sense, a message like this comes, comes close to the battle lines. Does that make sense? Like the enemy is actually doing something in our generation, trying to take people down through anxiety, trying to shrink people, trying to make them make silly decisions, trying to make them lose faith in God, lose sight of who he is. And we need to pray. 